is Alan Lanham. I'm Dean of Library Services. It's a pleasure to welcome you here to the library in the continuation of our uh, speaker series on the ancient Egypt and all related themes, apparently. Um, I don't know whether it is the mummy from Egypt or the uh, Halloween costume that's uh, joined us here, but uh, it looks like we will have an interesting uh, presentation once again. We've had a couple of weeks off for professional conferences and other things, and so we're ready to rev up the series once again, and I hope that you will join us this afternoon when Dr. Alan Baharlu will be presenting at four o'clock in the same venue. And then there are some other events uh, during the week. Please consult the program in the back of the room. Uh, welcome, and I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Wafik Wabi from the School of Technology, who has been the coordinator of this series. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session on medicine in the land <clears throat> of pharaohs. You're sick, you want to go to a physician or a doctor, and we, the 21st century medical technologists, we look into technology now that we are the top of the world. But guess what? We will have some surprises four, 5,000 years ago from the land of the pharaohs. Um, uh, this session brings us to the last week of the symposium and, and not at all a sigh of relief that we are approaching the end of this symposium, but really a sigh of joy, if this term is the right term to say, because it has been one, as one of the, uh, uh, my colleagues said, one of the most interesting and successful symposia that EIU has ever done. I'm not sure how big these words are, but uh, certainly we are delighted with uh, the outcome of this symposium. Um, to uh, Let me welcome the classes that uh, came today and the professors who brought their classes. Thank you, appreciate that. And I hope uh, you enjoy this uh, uh, session. And um, special welcome to the mummy. <laughs> and uh, a piece of chocolate will be given to whoever rec recognizes who the mummy is. <laughs> Uh, to introduce our distinguished uh, uh, speaker today, who is uh, my uh, associate chair for the department, uh, we uh, expected our dean to be here, but he is not feeling well, Madison. So, <laughs> so I leave this to our chair, uh, Dr. Uh, Woodley. Welcome to all of you, and I want to um, bring some greetings from the School of Technology as a co-sponsor for this symposium. I also uh, will be introducing several of the, the speakers this week as we close out this session. It ends on Wednesday, Wednesday night with the, the dance theme from uh, kinestology and kinesiology. <laughs> and so what I'd like to do is introduce Thomas Hawkins. He's going to speak to us about medicine in uh, ancient Egypt and we'll probably all learn a thing or two about how uh, that technology preserved I don't know what you're speaking about. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. Can I just put that there? Because I have this. Um, well, I'm glad to be here. And I would encourage you to come back and listen to Dr. Baharlu at four. If I'd had my druthers, if he'd not already taken geography, I might have done something with that instead, because that's a... Actually, uh, ancient Egypt's culture is very much shaped by its geography and the regularity of rain, and as opposed to a place like Mesopotamia where life was kind of unpredictable, it, it gave people a much more positive, the geography created a much more positive outlook. So I'm going, but I'm going to talk uh, about the interaction between sort of technology and technological change in ancient Egypt. Uh, we tend to think of technology as something modern, something new, but technology's been ar around a long time. You know, the first time we developed the ability to nap uh, a flint tool, that's technology. Um, when we began to be able to uh, use pyrotechnics, fire, uh, first to cook, and then we discovered you could also use that technology uh, in metallurgy. That's um, so technology is nothing new. There's ancient technologies, in particular around construction, is what I'm going to talk about. So um, I want to start 
Well, maybe I won't use this at all. Let's see if it really works. How I get it to go to the next. There we go. Um, if you were to think of, um, even today, and I'd like to hear from you, what are some ways that technology and medicine interact? Ways that changes in our technology have created medical challenges, but also the ways that medicine has been itself has been affected by technology. Can you think of some? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Right. 1906. The X-ray. So uh, we developed technologies that could begin to look inside people, uh, and, and that's an early one we have now, MRIs and ultrasounds and all kinds of uh, technology that's developed in the century that allows us to do better diagnostics, right? So sometimes technology improves medicine. What are some ways maybe technology and technological change create new medical problems, even in our own time. Can you think of some? Yeah. Well, yeah, radiation would be another one. Not just x-rays, but uh, leaking nuclear plants in, Chi in uh, Japan, for example, I guess. I was thinking, too, about, uh, yeah. Were you, did you think of one? Oh, you were waving at Bev. <laughs> Hi, Bev. Yeah. I was thinking we extend, extend life a little too long sometimes. Yeah. With the, with the use of, use of technology, uh, we have ways we can keep someone on life support much longer. Or you can think of some things like, um, anyone here in the room had uh, carpal tunnel surgery? Why do people get carpal tunnel? Yeah. Right, sort of a repetitive stress injury kind of thing. So you can have technological change or changes in human use of materials that actually causes new medical problems that people didn't used to have or didn't have as frequently. So carpal tunnel is a good example. Can anyone think of another one at all? Think about it. There probably, if you begin to think about it, um, any number of things. So, what I'm going to look about at is kind of the way that that some of those um, things between technology uh, and the the emergence of te some technologies in ancient Egypt uh, kind of created medical challenges uh, and medi and generated medical knowledge and um, also contributed to medical practice. So that's kind of what I'm going to look at, if these things will advance. There I go. OK. So we know, if you think about ancient Egypt, what do you think about as a technology of construction? Right? <laughs> Stones. Um, so if you were thinking about sort of a, a developing technology that used a lot of people to build stone construction, what are some injuries their version of carpal tunnel. Um, what are kind of injuries that would be associated with the discovery of the ability to large scale stone construction? Can you think of kind of injuries that might? Back injuries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trying to pick up big rocks. Back injuries, yeah. Fractures. fractures. Why, why would people have uh, fractures? Yeah, stress fractures. What else? Smashed feet, smashed fingers. Um, on construction sites today, what do we make people wear? Hard hats, um, steel-toed shoes, um, protective eyewear. If you're dealing with people that are dressing stones in some way, you're generating chips that fly every which way. So all of those are kind of uh, stone technologies that, that Egypt put to work building these things. 
and they generate a lot of injuries. Um, if you look, begin to look at Uh, some of the texts, the medical texts, there's lots of references to eye injuries, and there's a tremendous uh, uh, literature on how to take care of bone injuries, crushed bones, cracked bones, fractured bones, dislocated bones um, that um, are all connected with stone technologies. In fact, there's kind of a, in a Egyptian text called the satire of the tra trades. This violates the policy on uh, how you do slides, right, Deborah? But um, it's a quote from uh, the satire of the trades. The stone cutter uses a chisel to cut every kind of hard stone. When he's finished his work, his arms are wrecked, and he's worn out. When he sits down at twilight, his knees and his back ache. I speak to you also of the, of the mason who builds walls, always outdoors, exposed to the wind. He builds wearing only a loincloth. No protective eyewear, I guess. If you're wearing a loincloth, you should have come as that instead of ne maybe next. Um, no hard hat, no steel-toed shoes. So uh, we know there are injuries because other texts we have from the period uh, and references even talk about uh, workers uh, at construction sites being given sick leave. And uh, there are references in texts to um, essentially what we would now call the company physician, that they actually had uh, physicians that were a part of the construction site the way there would be supervisors and other people working at them. And this is a I wanted to share with you, this is a, a tomb of a sculptor. Uh, and it has around it, it a set of interesting um, pictures, right? They're their version of photographs. And I circled one of them. Can you see in this picture what... Uh, what it's depicting here. This guy is uh, working. Uh, this one up here is chiseling. He's got the mallet and the chisel. And the dust from it is doing what? Getting in his eyes. And when the dust gets in his eyes, he's dropped. This is a mallet. What has he dropped? And where is it landing? On his toe. On his toe. <laughs> so here you have eye injuries and foot injuries. So uh, he's going to be talking to the company physician about a few days off. And uh, you can see more dust. This one's chiseling and dust is falling everywhere. And here's another uh, interesting scene down here. Can anyone guess, just looking at this, what's happening here? This fellow is, uh, he's got a long tube in his hand. He might be blowing the dust out of his eyes, or he's certainly, and this one, you know, it's again showing a cloud of dust around his face. And up here is his medicine chest. And here is the vase in which he's mixing, or vial in which he's mixing things. So he's using a reed or a tube to either uh, pull something out of this guy's eyes or put some sort of ointment in them because it's an on-the-job injury. Where is OSHA when you need them? No, he's still working. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and there's a third one. I mean, there's dust falling everywhere here. Uh, if you look up here, uh, what? This is actually still how this is kind of done. Um, that's why it's 
so easily recognizable. But um, in this picture, what, what, what's this guy doing here? It, he, it might look like he's just picking him up off the ground, but he's actually doing something else that a physician would recognize. He's, yes, it's a dislocated arm. It's exactly the way you would uh, sort of put someone's arm back in place when it's been dislocated. So uh, you have at least three examples of uh, injuries connected with Egypt's development of this sort of large-scale stone technologies that they were using. You have people who end up picking up something that's too hard or falling and getting bones dislocated. You have people uh, mashing their toes. You have people getting their eyes injured. You have uh, all kinds of injuries associated with the technologies they're using. Comment about that picture? Other observation about it? Now, there's a papyrus called the Edward, Edwin Smith papyrus that is um, actually uh, a medical set of medical instructions, probably primarily for um, use with uh, these construction physicians in a lot of ways. It describes in it 48 uh, different kinds of trauma that a physician can treat. And 33 of those are fractures of one kind or another. Again, if you have people engaged in stone construction, you're going to end up with a lot of people who have broken bones and crushed bones and dislocated bones. And there are um, 27 surgical operations that concern, uh, again, pathologies of the skull or the face. Again, uh, you know, there's a reason we make people wear hard hats now on a construction site. You end up with a lot of skull and face injuries when people are working with stone technology. There's six uh, references in it that deal with the neck or the collarbone. Again, these are, uh, most of these are fractures and dislocations. And just a few of them uh, deal with things that are lower. In fact, the whole text is organized, sort of starts at the top of the body and works down in terms of these uh, injuries. And each one of the observations about the, these injuries uh, is very formulaic. Uh, it always begins with a title that says, Instructions Concerning, you know, uh, uh, a fracture of, of this or crush that. And then is, there's a description that begins, uh, if you examine a man having, and then it'll list the symptoms. And then um, uh, the third part of each observation is, uh, af you'll say to him, so you know the person comes to you with uh, an eye injury because uh, the a chisel has knocked a chip into his eye. He can't see or it's all bloody. Um, you, know, you examine it, it looks like this. So then you say to the person who has, uh, you say, Tom uh, or Jack or Bill or whoever, this is what you're going to do. And then in each of them, uh, it gives you three choices. So then you say, um, an ailment I'll treat, an ailment which I'll struggle with, uh, an ailment for which nothing can be done. What does this sound like? Anyone have been to an emergency room? It's triage. It's uh, exactly. It's uh, I look at you and you have a minor injury and I can treat it pretty quickly. I uh, I look at whatever this you know the observation and the description and I say, well, this is going to take a little more time, but there's a chance. And the third triage is not the group you want to be in, right? The one where he says, not much I can do for you. Uh, so, uh, again, a lot of these are fractures and injuries that uh, are obviously connected with the technologies they're using. And uh, what's fascinating about this is even in the cases where it says, can't do anything, the text is clear, you don't abandon someone. Uh, you know, it says, take care of him, don't abandon him. Try to 
I guess we would call this now palliative care. Try to make someone comfortable, even if uh, they're so badly injured they're not going to survive. And almost as a, it's almost always as a last resort that there's a reference to magic. You know, to using some sort of incantation or some sort of spell. Uh, otherwise, it's absent. Actually, it's absent from a lot of these texts, which is interesting because if you compare Egypt with Mesopotamia, those, the, the answer for any kind of ailment in, in uh, Assyrian, among the Assyrians texts on the cuneiform tablets is almost always magic. Because if you live in a geography where your borders are open and anyone can invade you at any time, and the rivers flood, but they flood unpredictably, what kind of world do you feel like you live in? If everything's unpredictable. A dangerous and uncontrollable world. Compare that with Egypt that had deserts. It had boundaries on each side that protected it pretty much from an invasion. Uh, the floods on the Nile, are they erratic and unpredictable? Yeah. But most of the time, within some range, you could kind of... They knew when they were coming, and, and they relied on them to bring uh, soil, new, fresh soil in. So you're dealing with a, a culture for which life felt a lot more predictable and safe. And so it its need to resort to magic uh, was a lot less than the Mesopotamians that felt a lot more life uncontrollable, unpredictable, and therefore, you know, you just sort of do whatever. This, the, 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 it produced a, a kind of approach to med medicine that was much more rational and practical, practical and so things as predictable and fixable in a lot of ways. And um, it's interesting that where the Greeks acquired much of their interest in medicine and much of their knowledge was from the Egyptians. Um, that this kind of practical, rational, observational-based kind of approach which would have been based in the technology as well, um, appealed, again, to the Greeks. It was much more, made mo more sense than just magic. We also know uh, if uh, their version of, uh, their response uh, to t construction technology was a lot of broken bones, um, they had to fix a lot of fractures. <coughs> And in many tombs and on many mummies, they knew how to use splints. They were very skilled in the technology of being able to set bones. Obviously, if you do it enough times, you learn how to do it. Well, but um, in many tombs, you'll find examples of splints. Um, this is another picture of the, a version of that shoulder reduction, they knew about, uh, because of the kinds of injuries they had related to the technologies they were using, they were pretty skilled at things like splints, about dislocations and how to fix them. Um, the eye injuries we mentioned. So um, let's talk about what you do when you get a crushed foot. Uh, if your foot really gets crushed, uh, what even now sometimes might be done with a toe or a finger if it just gets completely mashed by a multiple ton rock. <laughs> Will a splint help you? You'll amputate it. Um, if a rock this is why steel-toed shoes on a construction site are helpful. Um, 
you know, I would have great difficulty standing if I didn't have my big toe. You would think something so small as our big toe isn't that important to us. But actually, our big toe is essential for us to be able to stand. Think about it for a minute. Um, if you didn't have your big toe, think how often you balance yourself using it. Or when you're walking or running, think how often, you could, if you pay attention, you're always using that big toe. If it weren't there, you'd have problems. So, the mallet, the stone falls on someone's big toe. What happens to them? It's amputated. What do you have to do? Well, you develop, uh, if technology of the stone, uh, large-scale stone construction creates problems, technology kind of solves them. This is from a mummy. It's an artificial toe. So, uh, they, you know, you, it's an interesting uh, piece of construction. Um, also, you know, not long ago I read this book called uh, Catching Fire is the name of the book. And it's by an uh, anthropologist who teaches it Harvard. And his argument is we became human when we learned to, to cook. That cooking is what makes us human. Because once you cook food, uh, you don't need as big a gut, uh, which frees up energy to use in other ways. Once you uh, cook and you can soften, I, he talks about how uh, some of our uh, near relatives, uh, chimpanzees and gorillas have to, if they eat meat, uh, which they do, they have to sometimes spend like six hours chewing it in order to get it all broken down and swallowed. Well, if you cook meat, it makes it really digestible. So, you know, once we learn to cook things, we could eat meat, take its energy, and not spend all day consuming energy trying to, you know, break it down enough to, to get it in our stomachs. So, one of our earliest technologies really is cooking and the ability to cook. Um, and it's because we learned to cook food that we discovered how to make metal. Because without pyrotechnics, without mastery of fire and how to control fire and how to intensify fire, you would never be able to develop bronze or tin or any of those other things that we learned as we used fire to not just cook food but smelt things or make bricks that you fire that make them more hard. All those are pyrotechnics. It's a new technology that we developed on our uh, very early. So you have uh, sort of technological innovations in Egypt early on in food production. Egyptians loved bread. Now, why might bread well, any of you eat Wonder Bread? We eat it because it's nice and soft. So it's sort of hard to imagine that bread would cause any problems with your teeth, right? Even if you buy whole wheat bread, whole wheat bread is pretty soft too, right? Um, why might, as you introduce sort of large-scale production of grain, and the technology associated with that, and the technologies associated with uh, making flour and making bread, why might that have kind of a bad effect on your teeth? Any clue? In an age of wonder bread, it's hard to imagine this. Just take a wild guess. Anyone? The bread would probably be hard, but it's also what's in the bread. Yeah. Right. They, they had to, a much more tooth decay because you, you end up with, uh, you know, you're eating bread and, you know, they, I don't think they'd invented to, a toothbrush yet. But, yeah, the tooth decay is a big problem. In fact, some of the mummies, like Ramses II, had uh, 
you know, he must have been in an enormous pain. He had an abscess. It's not un uncommon in some mummies to find abscess teeth because of the degree of tooth decay. Um, but there's another reason. If you're, how, how did the, yeah. Yeah. How would sand get in your bread? Wind. When you're winnowing it? And where might some other places that rock would get near bread? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The mummy, uh, mummies can't talk, but he's right. If you're grinding it and you're using stones to grind your bread, what's apt to get in your flour? Little pieces of rock. And if you are harvesting it, you know, you don't have a combine out there with a nice cab on it, air conditioner and the radio on. Uh, what kind of tool at this early age would be you be using to harvest bread with, uh, wheat with, grain? A sickle, probably made of flint, stone. So you're using technologies to do all this that involve stone. Again, these people love stone. Um, well, at least it lasted a long time. Not like plastic. So you get people with a kind of general wearing down of their dental surfaces. You better watch out over there. Uh, in general, lots of uh, places their teeth are just worn down. And when uh, they've done testing of the bread samples, uh, because bread was left in the tombs with people as part of their uh, feed them uh, in the afterlife and in their journey there, uh, it all has a very high mineral and little stone, little uh, stone grain mixed in with the grain because you've got using technologies like flint sickles, you've got stone grinders, you've got sand getting mixed into it from the winnowing or the way it's stored and sand blowing into it. So if people have a lot of dental problems, what's a technology they might have developed to help deal with bad teeth? What do, what do we do? You think they uh, had root canals? They went to the dentist and the dentist gave them a root canal. You don't think they had a root canal? They might, yeah, they pulled them. And uh, of course it makes it very hard to eat if you've had your teeth pulled. So actually they had developed that's from a mummy. What is that? It's a bridge. Yeah. You could go to one of the dentists in town, and even now, they would do something like that. Well, not exactly. Are you surprised that early? They would have the technology. Yeah. No. <laughs> Not like we know anesthetic. And they wouldn't have even had, you know, in the, we talk about in the Civil War, you know, they would give people a good swig of whiskey and pull their teeth or pull the bullet out or something. Well, you know, they did have alcohol. Uh, but by our standards, their versions of alcohol would be very weak, about a third to half, a, half the alcohol content that our beer would have. They had beer. Beer was very common because beer, you know, probably developed by accident. When we started eating grains, uh, the easiest way to eat a lot of them was to eat them as gruel. You know, you just sort of mixed it up into a mash or paste and ate it, sort of like the Scots eat oatmeal <laughs> um, or grits or something. I don't know. But so they. But if you left it a gruel for a little while, made of barley, what would you? It eventually, whether you intended it to or not, what would, is it likely to do? It's likely to ferment, become beer. So they, you know, very early in our domestication of grains, we invented beer. In fact, we know the Sumerians had it. Lee could probably 
tell you all about that. But they um, they drank it out of straws. This is not the Egyptians, but the, we. I don't know who. I don't know how drank, they drank their beer, but the Sumerians drank beer out of, out of shared vessels through straws. Why did they have to drink it through a straw? Yeah. Yeah, it was dirty. <laughs> it had stuff floating in it. So you had to have a straw to drink the beer, and which makes, if you think about it, beer was essentially, uh, you couldn't, it was a social um, experience of bonding, drinking it, because you drank out of the same vessel. And there's an interesting book by um, Standage called The History of the World in Six Glasses. If any of you are interested in it, it talks about beer, wine, distilled liquor, coffee, tea, and Coca-Cola. <laughs> As uh, and talks, it kind of goes through the the impact of those drinks on human history. But one of the points he makes is there's still the sort of uh, echo of drinking beer out of a shared vessel. And what do people do lots of times when they're ever, they bring glasses or mugs of beer to the table and what do people do? Yeah, they clink the glasses against one another. Symbolically, what's that representing? Our glasses merging. Standage claims it's kind of this echo of the, you know, we've been drinking beer together for a long time. But anyway, teeth. They developed kind of a technology of, of teeth, caring for teeth. Although that looks like it would have hurt. Another technology that the um, Egyptians developed was mummification. And you probably know, originally that was something just done with uh, elites. Uh, as time passed, and we're talking centuries, it tended to filter down to other layers of the society. But if, you're, if you have people engaged in mummification, which was kind of a gruesome process, actually, pulling the brains out with hooks and things, uh, cutting the body and treating it, drying it out, what would some people, what kind of knowledge would uh, developing technologies associated with mummification give you? What would you learn a lot about? Anatomy. Yeah, you'd learn a tremendous amount about anatomy and phys physiology. In fact, they, they didn't understand uh, what vessels do, but they understand, they call them tubes. But, um, you know, they, they understood about arteries and veins and bones and, you know, you would gain a tremendous amount of knowledge of the human anatomy and of physiology simply by the growing technologies that were applied to mummification. And to do that, you've got to develop the tools, which is what technology is, to engage in mummification. But once you've developed those tools and that knowledge, what else can you use them for? On the living as well as the dead. So you have, um, again, these are things that are found, uh, various sites. They had lots of surgical knives. Uh, they aren't necessarily ones I would want my surgeon using on me particularly without anesthesia or antiseptic. Uh, in fact, what they used is, in some of the cases, what uh, their recipes for kind of what you put on wounds that were boiled uh, or versions of excrement, excrement, which doesn't seem to me like that would be really what you would want to put on a wound. but. They, uh, they would put excrement on it. Uh, scalpels, surgical knives, 
that um, were used on people. Copper needles, because once you've engaged in modification, you there are things you've got to sew, and those then become needles that they can use uh, to um, do things on other people. And there is a, a famous uh, piece of uh, construction, back to Bev's uh, ancient photograph. This may come from Ptolemaic times. Uh, it does come probably from Ptol Ptolemaic times. So it's not entirely clear. All of these surgical instruments are uh, Egyptian. Some of them may be Roman. But it's uh, from a tomb of someone who was a physician. And it has on it, in all these panels, A, B, C, and D, representations of surgical and medical tools. Some are easy to identify. What is that? That, that actually is a sponge. Uh, just looking at it and remembering that earlier picture, can you tell what those two things are? Yep, those are forceps. These are some sort of vials. Um, there are these are again like those surgical knives. Uh, I wrote these down so because I, I wouldn't be able to recognize these myself without a lot of help. Uh, oops! Oh my gosh, where did I go? Wrong way. D four. Oh yeah, shears. Uh, any of you raise sheep? Any of you here sheared sheep? Uh, I'm, alas, I'm the only one in the room. And I still have my father's sheep shears, you know, where we sheared off the sheep, uh, sheep's wool in the spring. And this, actually, this is a pair of shears that looks an awful lot like the sheep shears I had used as a child. Can you see the blades and the knife? Knives at the end. Um, C... Um, these are various kinds of hooked things that you would use to pull something out. Originally, things like that were used, you know, how they, in order to mummify, you've got to get the brain and all those things out. The way they did that was they used hooked things, went and pulled your brains out through your nose, um, put it in a canopy jar. Um, A7 is a saw. Ah, a saw to use to uh, cut through someone's bone or flesh muscle when you have to amputate. So, you know, they had a whole um, panoply repertoire of medical tools, medical technology that developed over time. Um, in part in response to needing to deal with the kinds of medical challenges they were faced by the technologies they were using. So, now to that last one. So what can we learn about the Egyptians, ancient Egypt, about kind of the relationship to, between illness and medicine and technology that's still true today? Anyone thought? Is there a relationship between technology and medicine or illness? What, what would, you're nodding your head. What would you, how would you state it? Yeah, there's a relationship between how, how our society works, the kind of labor we engage in, and the kind of illnesses we suffer from. I mean, carpal tunnel is one example. You could talk about um, 
You know, there's a lot of diseases related to our, just like they had diseases related to their diet, bread, with a lot of rocks in it. We have diseases that are related to our diet also, don't we? You know, we talk about, um, you, you know, our diet has too much of the wrong things in it. Or we're too sedentary because technology does so much work for us, we don't have to physically labor maybe once we the way we once did. So there are some complex ways in which the technological systems we use, ours are different than the ones the Egyptians used, but just as theirs created particular kind of medical problems for them, our technologies create particular kinds of medical problems for us. And the other side of that is that that drives technological change and innovation in the treatment of medicine as well. That as their technologies created certain kinds of illnesses, certain kinds of medical challenges, they came up with medical technologies that address the kind of problems they have. Is that still true for us? Can you, can you give an example of how it's still true for us? Anyone? I was thinking, when I was thinking about this, well, I was thinking about the artificial toe. And I was thinking about um, all of the innovation in the last few years as people have come back. Our, a lot of our tech, because we live primarily in a militarized country, um, an imperial country, we have lots of troops deployed in various places that come back with really severe injuries. So, what kinds, because of that, the military technologies we have, we can also keep people alive that once would have died on the battlefield. There's a lot of literature about that. About, uh, you know, you look at the death rate versus the, in Vietnam versus in Iraq or Afghanistan. So, we keep people alive that once would have died on the battlefield. But what what kind of injuries often do they come back with? Loss of limbs, lots of uh, head injuries. And so what kinds of technologies have we developed? It's amazing to me the kind of uh, limb replacement we're talking about now, or even people who've lost their sight, the development of um, technologies that help people in with eye injuries see. You know, the... There's ways in which some specific kinds of injuries that we have now in our society create uh, medical technologies that, that specifically address limb replacement and head injury and that sort of thing. But you could, you could think about that in any number of... Um, that's kind of one over here. You can think of carpal tunnel over there. You can think of uh, a lot of other injuries examples too. So that's kind of the main idea I wanted to get across. Comments? Questions? Time to go. I'm correct to think that uh, I always thought people who did the work on the pyramids and moving the big stones were pretty much slave-like labor, and yet it seemed like the, uh, the uh, physicians were very compassionate, stay with the patient even though it doesn't look very good. Is that... Uh, well, I thought that was, all that stuff was built by space aliens. I see. <laughs> um, I, I think they did, we probably, it probably was slave labor, but you know what's interesting about the Egyptian literature is, uh, again, compared with Mesopotamia, these were very gentle people. Everything, and they had a really, uh, you read the Egyptian literature, uh, their their poetry and their stories. They are very gentle people. They still are. Thanks. But you know, I mean, so the the compassion doesn't surprise me. It's uh, you know, you read uh, Gilgamesh. That's in Gilgamesh. Uh, it's the robotization of humans. You know, Gil, uh, Gilgamesh before he goes out and leaves off building the wall, you know, he, he's treating his 
uh, own people as slaves uh, to build the wall. And why are he in in uh, in Gilgamesh in Atrahasis, the met, met, uh, Babylonian myth? Why are humans created? Well, the gods got tired of doing the work, so the gods create human beings uh, to do the work the gods don't want to do. I mean, essentially, their view was human beings are just uh, objects of state capitalism, slaves of state capitalism, robots. But the Egyptians, uh, in some ways, were more, had a more humanistic, I think, a, a, a more gentle view of human nature than certainly the Mesopotamians did. My view. I don't know. Lee might not agree with that. I don't know. I have a question, quick question. Uh, is there any really a thread that ties uh, chemistry, physician, magician, uh, priest, religious thing in that time? Or is there any thread that ties these together? Mag magic and chemistry, religion, and what? With other physicians, things? physicians, physicians, chemistry, magic, and religion. Well, everything's tied to religion in the ancient world, so the quick answer is yes. But the specifics of that, I probably don't don't know. Any other question? Take the microphone. Well, hold on. Thank you very much. Thank you.